Welcome to this video on attacking corner kicks. We go over the data of attacking corner kicks. What are the trends in the modern game right now? And also I go over five ideas for attacking corner kicks, which I give you five set pieces for attacking corners. Some of them follow the trends of the current data and some of them are meant to give you ideas of how to kind of buck the trends and not stay with the trends. Um, how you interpret the data is all up to you. Enjoy the video. First, let's start with the reality of set pieces. People say there's four areas of the game, attacking, defending, and transition. I would say now there's five areas of the game because set pieces are so important. In this video, we're talking about attacking corners, but the reality is 25 to 35% of all goals are scored from set pieces. Now, there are some teams that score close to 75% of all their goals from set pieces. And that's not due to luck. If you want to look at like Tony Poulos at, at all the clubs he was at, especially Stoke City, that was part of their game model. It's something that they even selected players for. Rory DeLapp with his long throw, you had Peter Crouch, you had planned flick-in headers, all this kind of stuff was practiced and practiced and practiced at Stoke City and the results really paid off. If we look at data of over the last 10 years in Europe's top leagues, 3% of all corners have led to goals. Now, in-swingers are preferred to out-swingers because of the trajectory of the ball. So a ball curving in all you need to do is direct it, and it's easier to direct towards goal on an in-swinger. Now, when we do look at those in-swinging corners, um, first of all, 2.7% chance of scoring from an in-swinging corner compared to only 2.2% chance from an out-swinging corner. However, out-swinging corners lead to more shots on goal and the shots taken, though, from in-swingers are more likely to lead to goals, where the shots from out-swingers are less likely to lead to goals. However, there's an exception here. I would, I would argue that an out-swinging ball to the far post would be more effective than an in-swinging ball to the far post. The data suggests that near post corners are more effective than far post corners because the near post corner, the ball is in the air for a shorter duration of time, giving the defense less time to react. And obviously, if it's an in swinger to the near post, that's a very quick uh, redirection to the near post. Very difficult for a goalkeeper to handle that is positioned in the middle of the goal. It's hard for them to make up that distance to save the ball from a flick on to the near post. Um, obviously a far post corner, the ball is going to be in the air for a longer period of time, allowing the defense and the goalkeeper to react to that. Um, the other thing is that flick ons are very, very effective. You're talking about flick ons are 4.8% conversion rate. So compared to the data, which is anywhere, it says here 2%, but if 3% of all corners are scored, you know, 4.8% of flick-ons being scored is a very, very high percentage. So let's take the data and let's look at some ideas for attacking corners. I put these into corner kicks number one through five. Let's start with this first one, which follows the data completely. You have this player in, outlined in pink. That player is going to operate as a pick, um, like almost like a block in basketball, a pick. The middle player, we'll call him Van Dyke, right? For Liverpool, this is what they do quite often. Van Dyke will peel off as his man marker will be picked by the one in the purple circle. And then he will meet that ball on a run to the near post with an in-swinging ball. That ball could be headed far post, it could be headed near post, wherever Van Dyke heads that ball. So it on the defensive side, we could see there's two blockers, right? Out up top there with the, the team of three, with the players of three, and then they actually have six guys in, in a wall below. This is becoming more and more common on the defensive side, but you could see Van Dyke running in at full speed with his man marker picked, 
it becomes very difficult to defend that at the near post. And that follows all the current uh, data and trends of corner kicks. Now, I would argue to buck the trend of the current data that we go far post with an outswinger to your taller and best header of the ball who's isolated by himself on that far post. Even though the ball is going to hang in the air for a longer period of time, because it's at the far post and it's an outswinger, he can actually make contact outside of the post and put that ball in the top corner. So for me, this bucks the trend. Everybody is, ex is expecting near post, maybe even a flick on or just a near post runner with a pick. But instead, we go far post with our best header of the ball, a tall player, one-on-one, -on -one, outswinger, back post. Now look at, let's take a look at number three now. It's just a different setup. You have three players now. The one on the ball, the one next to him, and the one up at top of the box. All we're simply doing is looking for an in-swinging ball towards the back post with all these players crashing. And the in-swinger is hit from multiple different angles. It's, it's up to the, to the team taking the corner to figure this out, right? Are there, is it going to be two against two or is it going to be one against two like we see in this example here? So after one pass, we can just whip that into the far post because they don't have two players to stop this. Well, what if they bring two players? Can we bring that third player maybe a little bit late and fast towards the, the top of the box? And then can that player whip the ball into the back post with an in-swinger? It's just a different look. Now we're going to look at multiple options. So it's almost the same setup as before, but we have multiple options, right? We can, we can whip it an in-swinger right away if we want. We could play it out to the top of the box to the third player who's arriving late and fast. That player can now whip in that ball to the back post again, just like the previous play. Or can he switch the field and switch it to that far player who is going to run to the top of the box? And the two original players taking the kick, can they now come in and they could look to hit them with an in-swinging ball um, at that moment? So this just shows you a bunch of different options. And what happens is teams who defensively are very organized, focused, and prepared for the first kick. But once this ball starts moving with all these different options, they often lose their discipline, they lose their shape, and that's when you could take advantage of these defending set pieces. It's, it's often the second ball, the third ball, that gives them real trouble. And it, you know, It's not just the first. They're always ready for the first one. But are they ready for the second one? Do they lose their discipline on, this, on the second incoming ball? Or if we switch the field? Um, all these things are meant to unbalance that defense and give a little creativity to this attacking corner. And here we go with the fifth set piece. It's a complete switch of the field, right? And then once we completely switch the field here, can we whip that ball in? Maybe it's a good left footer. Maybe we play this ball in on the ground for the guy making the run to feet to this near post. You never know. But my point is this. Do you always follow the trends? Do we have to go near post? Do we have to have a guy like Van Dyke going near post where someone throws a pick on his man and it's an in-swinger? I mean, the data says that's the most successful right now. But I say you have to keep coming up with an original ideas to um, keep the defending unit unbalanced. Very, very important in my mind. And second thing to think about, do you have to throw these free kicks and do you have to do these set pieces and run them in the, in the beginning of the game? I say it, it would be interesting to run them in the middle or the end of the game where you have some standard set pieces that you take and then you throw in something special towards the end of the game. Um, so, so it's not, hey, let's use our set pieces the first chance we get. Well, how about we wait a little bit and then catch them off guard? So those are all important things to think about when you think about data and, and how to come up with some different ideas um, with set pieces. And then there's also some other things outside of the, the norm. Do you think about substituting in, in the last 10 minutes of the game, a six foot nine striker if you have one, a free, ki a free kick specialist 
if you have one. All these things are very important to to think about and not just be constrained by, hey, this is what everybody else is doing. This is what the data says. I'm going to be predictable. This is the only thing I'm going to do. How about bringing in a long throw specialist for, for the last 10 minutes of the game and pushing everybody forward? It really is something to, to think about and not just do what everyone else is doing.